there's golden. It's a golden moment and we're making it that way. We're gonna talk about classrooms for the future. I say classroom for today, <laughs> music and belonging. So what our speaker is going to do today, she's gonna to take a deep dive on what makes us feel like we belong, the importance of recipro uh, reciprocity and how music can be leveraged inside and outside the classroom. Our speaker today will identify challenges in our creating spaces of belonging and explore best practices for navigating multicultural environments as an arts educator and programmer. Please, as Elijah said before, place your questions in the Q&A box. Place your comments respectfully in the chat box because we're going to have a communication, a discussion today. So our speaker, Fumoto Nikoa, is an award, or not Koda, it, Koa is an award-winning, excuse me for messing that up there for a bit. <laughs> I love you. Is an award-winning speculative fiction writer. She is the founder of Dusky Projects. And as an educator, she collaborates with a variety of organizations to build a multicultural learning environment. Through the use of speculative fiction, fiction and creative disciplines, such as music, film, and performance, she designs and implement family-friendly curriculum and programming to address literacy, creative problem solving, and the importance of youth advocacy. She's a published author, a regular contributor to the Last Girls Club, and a member of the advisory committee at the door, the door. She holds a BFA in music theater from the University of the Arts and an MFA for performance and interactive media arts from Brooklyn College. Let's now warm welcome to you, Ramoto. The floor is yours. Wow, thank you so much for that very wonderful, I'm very, <laughs> I don't know what to do. I'm kind of like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this is a great intro. Um, wow, thank you. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. Uh, in the middle of July, I was I was worried that nobody would show up because it's nice outside and it's July. I was like, everybody's gonna be on vacation. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna talk about music and belonging. I'm gonna need to share my screen, Elijah. So just so you know, it's gonna bump out the sound for you. Um, but here we go. Here we go. Classrooms of the future, creating spaces of belonging through music. And, you know, I'm going to open with this question. When was the first time you felt like you belonged? And since Elijah was kind enough to put that out there, and I know that that's already going on the chat, feel free to keep commenting on that. I'll circle back to your responses and, and respond and reflect in what you wrote. I'm going to answer the question because I never like to ask people to do things that they don't want to do uh, without doing it first. So I put myself out there first. Um, so first time I felt like I belonged really is tied very much into music. Um, I come from musicians. So this is a picture you see me there cheesing right next to my aunt. She's the sexy one in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my aunt Manuela and this is her band she had a salsa band at the time and you know she was not the only musician on my mother's side of the family also my uncle uh he would play um a folk he had a folkloric band so I there was a lot of music they would come and rehearse in our living room and that really was the time that I felt like I belonged being a child and running around in their re rehearsals and being able to like practice on their drums and things like that uh, really felt like I belong here. I'm helping. I'm holding down the beat, <laughs> uh, even though I probably wasn't. <laughs> um, and that was not necessarily what was happening in school. You know, in school, I was a theater geek, dance geek, which, as you probably have guessed, did not make me popular. And, <laughs> and so it was a very, like, right there in the beginning, there was a split between where, who I was and my culture, you know, at home and in my life, and then who I was at school. It was like two different people. Um, this job as her backup salsa singer was the first job 
that I had. And in doing this job, I had I acquired many skills on the job, right? So we were, I had to go to rehearsal. Um, I had to learn these songs. I had to figure out the harmony uh, or learn the melody like by ear. I had to keep the choreography. I had to help set up. I had to help put thing, you know, like <laughs> take the set down. We had to travel places. Uh, this was a grown up band, meaning I was playing at like adult venues. So understanding the rules of that, each one had a different venue about having a minor performer. Most of the time I would either have to like stay on stage or stay on stage or on the dance floor. I was not allowed anywhere near the bar and that was kind of how they did it. Um, that was also a real sense of belonging of just being in the car and like, going to these venues and doing sound check, you know, like I'm a part of this like traveling music community, musicianship and musicians and musicians speak. And they were talking to me about like, yeah, when I was a kid and I first started to play trumpet, they wouldn't even let me stay in the, in the club in between sets. So I'd have to sit outside. You're lucky that you get to sit on the dance floor. Like all of this, um, all this mentorship, it was a very charmed time. I felt very loved. Uh, and taken care of. And that was not always what was happening in school. And I really didn't even talk to my friends about it that much, actually. Like they sort of knew that I did that, but they didn't know what that entailed. Um, so I think I'm just going to like move forward on this one here. Fast forward to arts education. I majored in music theater. And, you know, that was again a, a still a, a place of belonging, but there was a lot of myself that I wasn't really bringing to my music theater practice, namely the music that I had grown up with. Uh, I actually changed the way I sang once I got to school um, because that wasn't really what show tunes were about, but I did love show tunes, don't worry about that. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't like a sad thing. I just kind of like kept it on the down low. Uh, this is a picture of some work I did when I was abroad. Um, and it's interesting, this separation that continued even as I you know, moved into adulthood it's still, it's almost kind of like I wasn't connecting the dots, right? Like here I am in front of, this is a group of, of Hungarian children and this, this particular drama works is about bringing music theater to folks for language acquisition. So a lot of the times when you're learning a, a new language, it's very scary. Um, you know, people aren't always kind when you're practicing or you're figuring things out. It is always easier to learn the music of another culture than like speaking and it's that's something great that's a, kind of like an interesting thing about the brain i'm sure you've seen this on some singing contests where people will speak with an accent but that accent disappears suddenly when they start singing and they sound like they're from whatever country it is that they're singing the song from there's this ease uh, music is this bomb and when you share your music you share your culture you welcome people you invite them to come and join the party with you. So here I am teaching, we're preparing to go on for a show. We did lots of shows. Uh, I taught, you know, every, everything from like first grade up to high school in this project, in this particular program, all ELL learners uh, at a variety of levels. And a lot of the time the movement would help them uh, connect like, oh, this is the word for this because like my body does this. Uh, the beat, the melody, you know, you, it helps you remember how to say things. Um, and then from there, we could start to build conversations. But there were definitely instances where all we had in common were the music, was the music. Uh, and, I, you know, I didn't speak Hungarian. <laughs> so then there, and there was a variety of levels. So, you know, kids are very... <laughs> kids always want to help you out. You know, there's definitely times when they would go on and they would try to tell me and they'd like use hand gestures. And I was like, I don't know, guys, let's just put on the beat and figure it out. Um, so even then, the idea of creating the space of belonging through music was, you know, I understood that, but there was still like a parts of myself that I wasn't quite bringing to it. I was under the impression that they wouldn't be interesting or they wouldn't be interested to see that. And I just kind of want to touch on that about this like, you know, practicing separation that happens, I think, to a lot of us, depending on what school you're teaching at, right? Or where, what environment you're in, you know, there's a variety of levels of encouragement to bring yourself or not bring yourself. I've definitely been in some places where they're like, yeah, they're a little bit of a thing that you do in there. And I've been in some places where they, it's the other extreme. They're like, don't smile. Don't smile for the first part of the year. 
you know, and it's like a real us versus them type of environment that they are cultivating at their school uh, because of, I think, external pressures, these things that you have to get done with testing and common core. And so you draw this line. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have a balance between work life and personal life, um, but to really kind of create this distance between you and your students and thinking that like that's going to help them learn. Uh, I, I want to touch on that and, and challenge whether or not that's really true, <laughs> whether or not that's really what happens. So it starts to change when I become a part of this collective. Uh, community education is a collect was a collective of multidisciplinary artists that came together specifically to make music, funk, soul, and hip hop music. This particular collective is how I was able to travel and see the world and be in international settings and notice that the thing that would always bring us together was this music. It was participatory. So we would have these freestyle sessions. Um, we had two rules only for the freestyle sessions, which is one that you cannot be a spectator. You have to be involved in some way, even if you're playing the triangle or whatever. <laughs> and two, there was no battle rapping. Uh, so the, this wasn't about one-upping each other. It wasn't, a, it wasn't competitive. It was really about sharing and being in community. And we didn't always speak the same language, but we all spoke musician. <laughs> and so it was amazing for me to see the power of that, the way that, you know, I could, we could play a beat or, or, or sing a hook and everybody would, would rally around that. And then they would bring their own personal experiences, people that I had nothing in common with, people that we didn't share anything. Uh, and somehow we shared this. So that was profound because it helped me communicate in many settings. I was in Germany, I was in Serbia, I was in Croatia, I was in Hungary. Um, and for some people, you know, going back to language acquisition, some of them that listening to the music is how they learned the language. It's, it really was how they were able to cultivate the skills to even talk to other people from other places because they were listening to the music. And one guy, you know, I was sitting and talking with him and I usually don't comment on people's language skills because I, I think it's kind of rude, but I couldn't help because he sounded like he was from the States. And I was like, your English is incredible. I, did you go to a special school or something? And he said, Wu-Tang, Wu-Tang taught me English. And so he sounded like this dude from Staten Island and he was from Budapest. It was wild. <laughs> it was wild. So that definitely left an impression on me. And I just want to share this quote. The critical issue is reciprocity. Being truly heard and seen by the people around us, feeling that we are held in someone else's mind and heart. I think a lot of times in our training as educators or even you know, for educational administration, we talk about safety and we talk about creating safe places. And that's hard. Uh, I wanna acknowledge that safety is a difficult thing to define and it means something different for each person. Also, sometimes it is just out of your hands. You are in there. It's been a long day. Maybe you have more students than you planned. Something happened, someone called out sick. You got 30 some odd kids and you're supposed to be in charge of all safety right now. <laughs> there's a lot of external things that, you know, there's a lot of things that can just happen and you don't have control over everything. You just don't. So I wanna refocus away from the word safety and safe places and talk about reciprocity. Building a place of reciprocity, that is something that you can do. And that then has like a snowball effect, right? Conflict might happen, but if there is reciprocity, you can get to the other side of it. Does that make sense? All right. So here's what I'm finding in music and in the music that I'm, that I'm, that I'm experiencing in my personal life and not bringing, <laughs> by the way, into my classrooms. Um, 
And that, you know, I, was, I decided, mm, maybe I should shift that a little bit. So I do kind of want to just look here at your responses just to see about when you guys felt like you belonged before we move into bringing music into the classroom. And I thought I was looking a bit earlier and I noticed that a lot of people mentioned whenever I walked into my elementary school arts rooms teacher, art teacher's room, Miss Sunshine, what a great name. Um, finding love when I married my husband, family reunions. Uh, I remember the feeling of belonging in our library's children's section. Yeah, library is absolutely me too. <laughs> uh, my first visit alone to my grandparents, parent of a Head Start child, when my gym teacher asked me to join the cross country team because he noticed that I was good at running. It became the second family for the rest of school. I see a lot of mentions of like sporting events, family, track team, Lots of being a part of a team when I met my group of Ghanaians in middle school, family pictures, uh, Brooklyn College and that, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, you, you notice that the thing that's coming into, into play here is being in community and teamwork and helping each other out and collaboration, which you know are skill sets that, that are built when you're making music because you have to, it's collaborative. You can't, you cannot, you just cannot do it in isolation. Um, and I want you to also reflect on whether or not what you were experiencing was reciprocity. What you were experiencing there was that you were in with people that truly heard and saw you and held you in their minds and hearts. And that was why you felt like you belonged. So I started to bring it into the classroom once I got hired to work at this um, particular program, Urban Arts Partnership, uh, it was called Fresh Ed. And the whole point was to bring the skill set, the craft, the discipline around making music into the classroom to teach Common Core, in particular ELA. So we would break down how you write lyrics from like, this is how you make a good chorus. This is how you, this is how you make lyrics here. And then we would use some of the things that they had to do in ELA and write songs about it. And so this is a picture of me with seventh grade class. The students are performing and recording their argumentative essays. So, you know, something that they need to do, learn how to do um, through, the, through the art of verse. And as you can see, I also would really engage everyone to also work with the tech too. So it wasn't like, I hold all the tech and then you do the thing. Like she's holding the mic, this other one here is, is recording it, you know, on her device. Um, they're so savvy, they're so tech savvy anyway. You might as well let them bring those skills too. What I noticed is when I started to bring myself, right? Bring my music, my culture, my experience, my disciplines in these other places into, into the classroom suddenly we were all together. They felt like they could bring themselves. That I did not know was gonna happen. I honestly thought these kids would be so bored to know this part of me. <laughs> and it was the opposite. It gave them permission to share that part of them. Uh, and then it sort of trickled out into other, other things. I started to think about the way these venues operate and the rules and and how I could bring that into the classroom as well and what that, what that teaches them about moving in different spaces, which is what's gonna happen when they you know, go out into the world as adults. Um, so one thing is transforming the space. Sometimes I would you know, bring in videos of venues and the way they operate and say like, okay, so here's the performance space and here's where you come up with the mic and you perform and everybody else has to be quiet. Um, there were a couple of times when I would bring in like slam poetry videos and then it's like, okay, you're going to write a poem and this is how you do it. And we're going to like create a little thing over here. You're going to hold the mic. I'm going to do this. Like the whole setup, you're going to be the MC. Like I really assign the roles. I know some of you are educators who are probably, um, have heard about process drama. So that's what a lot of this is. Uh, but basing it off of my experiences really it made it comfortable for me to talk about it with a certain agency. And because I did, they felt that trust. They felt that reciprocity. I was inviting them to express themselves. And that built this rapport um, so that when there was conflict, we were able to get through it. And everything ever really, 
exploded the way sometimes it would in other classrooms or did at other times. Um, because I was inviting them to do this, I had to invest in youth, youth culture. So it was not always like what I was into. I really had to be like, what are you into? What do you like? Uh, and here in the corner, you see this, this little quote, since I left, you make me feel that love. At the time, Drake had just come out with Hotline Bling. So that's when, <laughs> that's when I made this, <laughs> did this project. Um, I didn't love the song, but they loved it. So printed out the lyrics and said, you have to rearrange these lyrics. You know, we're, the unit is poetry. We're gonna write a poem using Drake's words, but the goal is I can't recognize the song. So it can't be a remix of Drake's song. It has to be a whole new, whole new thing, whole new song, whole new poem using only the words that he said. So they would cut it out and they shifted them around. And I thought that this was such a great poem since I left. You make me feel that love. I feel like he gave Drake a run for his money. <laughs> so there were moments like this where I would ask them what they were into. I would take into account it's, I'm not saying that you guys have to be fans. I mean, they are children and you are an adult. They're going to like things that you are just not going to be into. <laughs> but you can incorporate it into what it is that you're doing. And again, use that as a bridge for communication and for skills, for developing skill sets. And then finally, in doing that, in writing skill, in writing lyrics, it built literacy. And in doing that, it built agency for myself and for the students. So now we're gonna talk about taking that into other spaces, right? This is the classroom. It's kind of a little, you know, it's a room where you've got control. You can set up chairs and you can do all the things. Um, but then they go outside. <laughs> and then they go out into the hallway and the whole other world is happening out there. So when I moved into uh, arts education administrative side, you know, when I kind of got out of the classroom, um, I was like, how can I bring, you know, what I'm learning here and what I've, I finally like bridged this, like here I was doing this thing outside, I bring it into the classroom and how do I bring it into the rest of the school? So we started uh, working with the, the school staff, the principals and assistant principals to bring music into other spaces. First with the family workshops, some of you maybe have to, family workshops are, are required to organize, you wanna figure out ways to engage the parents in your school and what you're doing. And again, you want your school to feel like a community, but people are working all the time and they don't wanna come into the thing and they don't wanna to talk to you. And it's like, what do we do? Um, music, again, everybody can show up and listen to music and have a good time. And then we sneak in the learning. <laughs> So here is uh, a family workshop run by one of the teaching artists that I was managing. And he had this fun game he would play where he would start the rhyme and then you would guess how it would end. And you would sort of accidentally rap with him. And this is the assistant principal at the school uh, taking part in that. Keep going and fill in the blank. Okay, we're gonna start with the beat drop. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. So this morning, you're just gonna fill in the blank in the mic so everybody can hear, so they can see this magic happen. Yes, we travel southwest, east, north. Yo, Mrs. Hall, if it's not true, then it must be off. Oh, this hour is coming off. Every time he come back, yo, it's all so, yo. He got the gravy. He's in the place to be. The water's flowing like this. It's kind of wavy. wavy. See, this how we do it. She really nailed it. Uh, this created this space where everybody was kind of letting their hair down and parents got to see the principals and the schools and the teachers that they work with that they have to come in and deal with as people. And so did the kids. They sort of saw other sides of the school, of their teachers and of their parents because they were all having a good time. And that, it's like breaking a fourth wall. Like then, then you start dealing with each other as people. That's what happens. Uh, you just can't, you can't help it. 
And again, I didn't necessarily know that that was, that was what I was hoping would happen. But once I really saw the power of that, I was like, you know, we kept doing it. We kept bringing in different, different kinds of, of music workshops because it was just, it just helped relationships in other spaces. Once they see, once you take the Afro-Columbian workshop together, you treat each other different the next day. Once you see Miss Hall rap, you feel differently about her. And shout out to Ms. Hall for just going ahead and trying it. So we brought this into school assemblies. Uh, I know that you know sometimes schools are required to have assemblies about certain things and it's not necessarily like you planned it uh, and it can be hard to figure out well, what are we gonna do? And so again, I said, well, how about we bring in music? Uh, we brought in a lot of local musicians and they, you know, whatever the theme was, they would do a set on that theme. And again, it's much easier to listen to a song about bullying than to watch a PowerPoint presentation about it. It's also easier to just let somebody sing a song about bullying than it is about, than it is to like try to get everybody to be quiet so you can go through your slides, right? Like, you know, the teachers were also very happy to not have to do that. And again, in doing that and everybody celebrating and being involved in this song, we got to see these other sides of each other and be in community and it, really had this ripple effect across the environment of the whole school since we were coming in to listen to a concert. It also felt so different to come to an assembly to hear music than to have somebody talk at you, right? A lot of the times people have to make speeches and they have to make this announcement, but to know that you're coming in and there's music being played and music is happening and we're gonna dance and sing and still talk about this, this subject, um, people were just more open for that. And when I say people, I don't just mean the students. I mean, you know, staff that has to come here too. It's, it's hard, you got a long day. And here is a respite, an actual respite. I've thought about you, I've held you in my heart and mind. I chose this for you. It is a space of reciprocity. So here is the anti-bullying assembly. Steph Reed is performing from his, his album called The Love Project. He does a lot of things about, about love and the importance of love. And I just wanna show him and also the audience <laughs> and how they feel, mind you, on the stage. There's just like, you know, this keyboard and a guitar and he's just there singing and playing a tambourine. I've never seen anybody respond to a man with a tambourine so strongly. It was really something. <laughs> in general, in thinking and refocusing about creating a space of reciprocity and that then creates a space of belonging. What really ends up happening when I started to bring my full self into these classrooms and they had the permission to bring their full selves into the classroom is joy. The impact was joy. That's what ended up happening. We accidentally had fun while we were learning. Um, it's not always easy to do. You know, I recognize that there's a lot of external factors, uh, but we did it and it made an, a lasting impact on, on all of us. Uh, so yeah, I highly recommend this. All right, so that's all well and good. And hip hop was, you know, I was making hip hop and I brought it into the classroom and that's great, but, um, what happens when you don't look like your students? <laughs> what happens when you're in front of students and they, they don't listen to what you listen to? Uh, they, how do you find something in common? Um, you're total opposites. 
and maybe you're you got thrown into a classroom you didn't even know that most of them don't speak english you don't speak the other language they speak you know there's all these different scenarios that happen and it's like okay now what uh because i don't feel like i belong and so you don't feel like you belong and we're just kind of sitting here looking at each other um so i want to talk about some best practices in those moments which is be curious be curious about them okay they're from someplace else what is that place like you know do some research on what do they speak there what's going on there what what does the music sound like from that place it works both ways it's not just when people learn show tunes and pop tunes from america they get a sense of the culture they get they their accent disappears all those things it's also the other way around you can also listen to to music from other places and learn hooks and choruses and and get a sense of what's happening um it can it can be that identify what is important and let the rest go this is hard because again you've got bosses or you've got deadlines or you're in charge of a thing and you have to manage it you have to make sure that certain things happen um and it can just be stressful and overwhelming especially now with everything that's happening there's lots of deadlines uh, there's lots of different forces pulling at you in those moments it's good to just stop and breathe and say well my the period is what 50 minutes long 45 what can you really do what really matters is that they can do xyz and then you just let the rest go you get to it tomorrow you get to it next week you'll get to it maybe they'll figure it out on their own but you are one person and this is what you can do incorporate and amalgamate again like i said it was investment in youth culture i learned about what they were into but i also brought a little bit of myself i also brought a little bit of you know what i was into and did like a little mishmash there and they dug that um also there were times when i brought in things thinking that they wouldn't know the song and they did know the song so never underestimate your students they they have the internet and and they do know what you're talking about even when you think they don't and lastly, ask your students, um, especially, you know, I've worked in spaces where I don't always share the language, but there's usually a student in there that speaks a little more English than everybody else. And I basically give that student a job and it's like, you are now my assistant. <laughs> you are now gonna help me do these things. Um, but if you do share the language and you wanna know like, well, what about this? Well, what about that? Do you know how to do this? Ask them, like they are experts, acknowledge their expertise and they will acknowledge yours. And I find that that works in lots of other spaces. So here is me like totally out of the element, right? I'm in Dusseldorf, um, the Tanzhaus, uh, NRV in Dusseldorf, Tanzhaus means, as you can probably guess, dance house. Most of what happened there is dance classes. I pitched a music theater class, like maybe people would like this. Lots of folks showed up. It ended up being a really dedicated like glee club that ended up happening. Um, and they were really into show tunes. So I was like, all right, we're gonna sing show tunes. So here's me in Germany with a bunch of German folks <laughs> singing a song from Rent, if you will believe it. Of the things from rent we also did some things from a chorus line um we got more and more advances we kept doing we started recording ourselves as you, saw, as you see there that's not where it started but i was like let's bring in all these things uh that i had you know was doing in my in my own music um and that was a special time i really loved that that group that would come in and it was you know different every semester and it was you know at a dance house but people getting getting together and seeing is was a wonderful community experience. Now, in South Brooklyn, 
I was, uh, it was a, it was a summer program and it was again using, the point was to use Broadway songs and in particular, The Lion King. Now, where I was in South Brooklyn, the community was made up primarily of uh, young first arrivals from various parts of China and Asia and Russia. So I don't speak Chinese and <laughs> I don't speak Russian. And, you know, the littler kids were fine with singing and dancing, but the eighth graders, not so much as I'm sure some of you know from working with eighth graders, they're really too cool, too cool for school. So, <laughs> and I'm gonna show this video because this wasn't necessarily like, hey, I'm teaching you a song. We have a beat to help us um, communicate. You know, that's not always gonna be the place that you can't always do that. Uh, but I do wanna, and in part the 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 power of sound of soundscapes of sounds tracks and of jingles and just quickly asking everybody do you know what a jingle is can you type in the chat um if you know what a jingle is when i say jingle do you know what that means yes like in a commercial yes that's exactly it jingles are short little musical things that are used to sell you something. <laughs> they are often, they're used to get you to buy a thing. They get stuck in your head, they're catchy. Mentos jingles are my favorite. Oh my God, Mentos fresheners. Da, 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 men, Mentos fresheners, da, 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 full of life. Mentos, the fresh that's, makers. That's <laughs> it. I remembered everything. Sometimes you'll hear a jingle and you'll be like, oh my God, yeah. And then suddenly you're, you're back there. Um, that can really help you those things travel far and wide and they can communicate larger ideas without you having to actually like go through all the rules like all the granular things in between because they understand the reference immediately um so please please leverage these jingles <laughs> yes uh so here we used we retold the lion king through a series of tableaus. So they would do these different poses to show the major parts of the story. And I took a picture of them. And then the children sat down and assigned sounds to each of these pictures to tell the story. And that helped communicate, you know, the story, tone, there was a lot going on there. But it wasn't like we sang songs. Still, I'm using music, I'm using jingles, I'm using these things to get them to understand, to communicate with them the story of The Lion King. And we made a little video, so here's here it is. Pretty straightforward. We had a really good time. Uh, there was a bank of sound effects. I, th I think I just used like iMovie <laughs> on the laptop and was able to communicate a very complicated story to a, you know, a classroom of students where we didn't even necessarily share the same language. Um, I also highly recommend flashcards as <laughs> well, everyone, just on the side there. Um, I want to segue a little bit into, because I know there's going to be some folks here that aren't necessarily in classrooms or at schools, you're programmers, you're in other spaces. So I want to talk about inclusive programming um, and just the, the difficulty around, or like not difficulty, the challenges around that. Um, doing this work in classrooms, I was able to bring a lot of like it's transferable skills. So a lot of that into programming, the same thing applies, the same best, uh, best practices apply. So being curious, like when working at Little Island, which maybe some of you have been to, if not, check it out. It's on the Hudson River. It's on 14th Street in Manhattan. It's this wonderful island that looks like a leaf floating on the river. It's very exciting. 
And I pitched this idea of a mobile library. So we already had this art cart, as you can see, this round structure here. And it was mainly to, for the teaching artists to have different crafts materials when they would teach workshops. Um, but we wanted to have some kind of programming on it there where people could just be self-guided. And I think books are fantastic and I want everybody to read and care about books and libraries. So I was like, what about a mobile library? And each month there would be a different uh, curator and they would be sort of like a spotlight. So one month was the Free Black Women's Library and they would curate everything on it. And then the next one was Women in Comics. And then the last one was Teatro Sea, which is a bilingual theater um, company for young audiences. So they had, they also make books. So they had their books, they brought their puppets. Uh, that was pretty fun. I think Free Breckham's Library um, had reading time as well. Just kind of sort of happens naturally and organically. So they would read books. I told them to skew more on the side of young, young adult literature. And Women in Comics, I made sure that they were able to give away some free comics. So everybody could get a little comic. Um, again, this is just like, books are cool, reading is fun. Um, but the task with Little Island was it's supposed to be a park for all, but how do you do that? How do you make a park for everyone in New York City? <laughs> they have a lot of different kinds of people. So again, being curious about, you know, partners, people that have the capacity to, to, to do this, like already had a free Black Women's Library is already a mobile library. Um, you know, knowing what's important, letting the rest go, which is that I just want people to read and be excited about books and see different kinds of authors um, and pique their curiosity and every, and that's it. Like anything else that would happen, I just had to let it go. <laughs> Maybe whether, you know, whether they took a book or not, or whether they took a comic or not, but just like, can you come over here and look at it <laughs> and be interested in it? Um, incorporate and amalgamate, you know, some of these partners I've worked with before, so I'm definitely, you know, incorporating myself, but amalgamating because, you know, it's got to be on this mobile thing. I was like, hey, bring this part and maybe don't bring the like more adult graphic novels, like <laughs> all of that. And then again, asking, asking students, I think is a good segue into this next part here, which is today, everyone, I am on the advisory committee of The Door, as Fanny had mentioned. And the door is a center for that services uh, housing vulnerable youth with lots of wraparound services. They're in downtown Manhattan. They offer lots of different things. And I put them in touch with women in comics um, as part of like, let's try doing this. So today from 12 to five, there's going to be a Comic-Con. And this was definitely a process in which we asked the students. They have a youth council. So first I asked, you know, Regine, who runs Women in Comics, do you want to do this? I asked the door, do you want to, do you want to hold a Comic-Con? Are you guys into that? Then we went to the Youth Council and said, do you want a Comic-Con? <laughs> you know, I'm going to ask these young people rather than just deciding that this is what they need. Um, and they did. And then I said, okay, well, what else? We can do workshops beforehand. What would you want those to be about? So Regine also did some virtual workshops and even them being virtual was very much the input of the youth council so that everybody could come. So there was two virtual workshops around like, you know, crafting your own um, comic book and I think developing character, things like that. There was a very like brass tacks skills and they, they, lay, they are leading up or have led up to this Comic-Con that's happening today right now, woohoo! Um, incorporated Amalgamate, the AfterCon Kiki cosplay ball. I know that the door has a textile department where they're getting, they encourage young people to create their own outfits and things. So I thought, oh, a cosplay ball would be good for them to flex. Um, for those of you who do not know what cosplay is, <laughs> it is short for costume play. So if you've ever seen any movies, or if you've ever been around any any time when the New York City Comic Con is happening, and you see all these people in these crazy outfits <laughs> dressed up as like um, you know different Marvel heroes, that's cosplay. Um, kiki, for those of you who do not know what a kiki ball is, because I had to learn, um, it, it is something in queer culture. There are a lot of uh, queer youth at the door, and in just in general in life. 
Um, and so Kiki is basically a kind of party where you hang out and you vogue and you learn things from each other and you just have a good time and you Kiki, I guess like a social thing. Um, so the Aftercon Kiki Ball is happening. Again, that's incorporating and amalgamating these two ideas. Today, uh, please, if you are in the city, stop by, check it out. Um, knowing what was important and letting the rest go, what was important was that we had an event that was outside, that could happen outside so that everybody could be safe. Um, putting them in touch with professional mentorship. So having those classes and then having more opportunities with panels and different things. That's what happens at, at Comic-Cons is different panels and workshops. So they, anybody who was interested in joining the industry had somebody to talk to about it or had a way to even explore the idea that they might want to. Um, Comic-Cons are usually consistent, like they happen every time, same time every year. So the idea is that this is a relationship that would keep going and we, they would keep coming back and they would have access to the network of women in comics, which are some heavy hitters that work in, in the comic book industry, which as you know, is huge. Everything from publishing comics to working on Marvel shows. And, you know, for a young population that is maybe down on their luck at the time when they go to the door, this really is a place already that creates reciprocity. And this then furthers that so they can continue having that as they grow into adulthood and move into professional spaces. Um, not necessarily music, although if it's a kiki ball, I'm sure there's going to be music there. But the same ideas, the same principles, the same skills being moved over even into other disciplines and other things that aren't necessarily music driven. But to bring it back to music, though, music binds together people who might individually be terrified, but who collectively become powerful advocates for themselves and others. Along with language, dancing and marching and singing are uniquely human ways to install a sense of hope and courage. This little uh, gif here is the um, in-school recording studio that we made <laughs> in the supply closet. <laughs> it doesn't have to be fancy. It's not really about that. If anything, bringing in that spirit of like, we can do it, we can do it anywhere, was really inspiring for myself and for the students. Uh, it let them know that like, you can do this, you have agency. See, we just did it in the supply closet at school. You can take that other places. Um, and you know, at this point, people understand hip hop culture and understand this home recording, home recording studio aspect of things. So the fact that they're doing it too, sort of shortens that, that gap, you know, between what is possible and them standing there, right? Um, music is a bomb. It is, it is a bridge. It's really helped me cross some very wide cultural barriers and even eased difficult situations. Um, it can diffuse conflict. Uh, I always say that music is the shortest distance between two points. So now we're going to reflect, we're going to get into the part where we like talk to each other a little bit. Um, you already answered when was the first time you felt like you belonged. I am curious about what was it about that space? Some of you put, you know, the sporting events and things, but what was it specifically now that we've talked about all this? that made you feel like you belong? Can you identify what that person was really doing or what that space was really providing? If you can just talk in the chat. And now, and then we're gonna open this up here to any other questions you might have for me. Should I stop sharing? Um, that's up to you. We have a question in the question, um, the Q and A box. But there's a lot of comments. I don't know whether you've had an opportunity to see them. I have it's not. Let's great, let's, let's. great, 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 great comments. Thank you for I bringing. Put... Oh, you wanted to go ahead and read it. Go ahead. No, I'm just. I just realized someone was like, "Comic books, anime, and mangas." Ah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but go on. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, that's alright. That's okay. Thank you for bringing yourself to us and to these kids, and amazing work and yet another fabulous program. So the, these are some really positive comments. Um, 
getting people together to laugh and to have fun. These are just so many great comments, but I want to get to this question because we only have six minutes left. Yeah. And, um, and if it's okay, yes, keep, please. Putting the, keep putting the Q and A or questions in the Q and A box and please keep with your chat. This is so um, encouraging. Um, but before I ask this question, I, I just want to say that my, this was so enlightening for me because I saw how music and the arts is so important in forming relationships and how it brings joy to learning, you know, and um, having fun while learning. These were some of the major um, comments that I just took down. And, um, and I love that quote um, about the, the, from the book title, the book, the body keeps the score. Mm. It does. If you're having joy, the body is going to keep that score. And if you're not, the body is going to keep that score as well. Yeah. Um, and I had um, a question, but I'm going to ask this one first. Someone wrote, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. You've taken leaps to bring other parts of yourself to the classroom and thereby giving your communities and students permission to bring their whole selves to the creative process. How did you get the confidence to take those leaps when you weren't sure how it was going to land? Yeah, I mean, there was definitely training in this. You know, as I said, I had, I had some mentorships. I wanna talk about music and mentorship, both in and out of the classroom. So other educators that do this, um, shout out to Jamel Mims, Ebony Hogan, oh my God, James Miles, who's over at Seattle. I forget what corporation he's running. So, you know, I had some guidance, but at the end of the day, you just kind of have to jump <laughs> and <laughs> it might not land. It might not land, but I do notice that in the jumping and in the doing of it, the response, even when it doesn't quite work, you know, you think on your feet, figure it out, try something else. Um, students still respond to the fact that you are bringing fun into the room and they mm -hmm. want to, they want to do it, you know, mm -hmm. so sometimes like don't necessarily think that they aren't going to meet you halfway. They, they will, it might take a minute depending on what happened before. Um, and you might, you know, you might want to think about some of the games or things that you've seen them play. Like again, when I said ask students, you know, invest in youth culture. If there is a video game that they're always talking about, use the sounds from that. Start with like what you know is probably going to land, like play, play to the audience basically, um, before you start bringing in things that might be a little more complex, you know? So you, it's a journey. You're like, I'm going to try this this one time. And then maybe next week I can bring in this other thing and I, I can make it harder and harder and harder, more complicated, more sophisticated every time. But if everybody's always talking about Fortnite, gamify the whatever thing that you've got to do in your classroom, like Fortnite. <laughs> Use Fortnite sounds. Like, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, and then that first success, that's kind of how you build your confidence. You're like, oh. I did it the one time and, it, and I didn't die. <laughs> I can do this again. Also, you'll notice that once you do it and it, go, and it goes, you know, even if it's just like kind of good, like not exactly what you wanted, but once you open that door, their expectation is gonna be that you to keep doing it. So in a way you sort of force yourself to have confidence <laughs> because they're gonna have this expectation of like, yeah, you, you do that thing that's fun. And we're expecting it now every time. <laughs> That is so wonderful. There are some really good questions. I really want to hear the answer to these as well. And um, and here's a, oh God, I don't know which one to ask because I want the answer to all of them. Um, the video and game music that you talked about, it, it was influential in the classroom. Can that also, that same type thinking be transferred into early care settings? You know, like yeah, definitely different music, I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're going to have to like, I did like a, Google search of like, who's doing like New Orleans, young, mm -hmm. early learners, you know, like you'd be surprised at how many people are on YouTube doing all kinds of things. Use what they got. Um, but definitely in early, in early childcare education, music is so essential just to even teach like words, like, cause now you're at the beginning of language. 
So mm. that actually even helps that as well. Assigning yeah. a rhythm or a song to it is how they might get talking. Yeah. Actually yeah. talking. So, and also, you know, when you're, if it's two to five, you put on a song and you, they're going to copy you. So you dance in front of them and you assign the, you know, moves to the song. It is the way, is the way you're going to get their attention because they are, two-year-olds will not pay attention to you, three, they will, they're not going to, they're going to run around, but right. they won't if there's a song playing. So definitely in those spaces, like they will save your life. I, I always say when in doubt, Play-Doh or freeze dance in terms of best practices, y'all. Um, even if you, you know, if you're like, we have to learn this thing and you have to get everyone's attention, play, do freeze dance. Everybody, it's a basic game. Everybody understands it. <laughs> And then, and then they're paying attention to you. Thank God. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. Well, wow. well, thank you so very much. Um, we're at the end of time. I can't ask the other questions, but I can tell you, we want to thank you so very much for bringing this very engaging and formative conversation to this platform. Um, and if you had an opportunity to look at any of the comments, the thank you, thank you, thank you beautiful responses to your work and so proud that you were able to join us. And I just wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here with us. For those of you who joined us today for this hour, we wanna thank you because you could have spent your hour any place else, but you chose to spend it with us. And for that, we're forever grateful. And we look forward to seeing you next month. And we're hoping that we'll be able to bring Wimoto back for a part two. Everybody have a great evening, great afternoon, enjoy your day. Much love. Thank you so much for having me and for being so receptive. I really appreciate it. I'm sorry I didn't get to all the questions. Um, somebody asked if there was contact information for me and I can, should I give Well, what we're going to do when Elijah sent out the information, because he, he usually responds to everybody. But if you want to drop it in the chat box, please feel free to do that. But yeah, you sure. can this in the information out as well. Um, but please feel free to drop that. For those of you who's still hanging around, and you want um, Wimoto's um, contact information, she, she's dropping it in the chat box. But for those of you who did not get it, it will come out when we send out the information or the recording, right? Elijah, okay. I have to look to Elijah. He tells me, he keeps me on track. Is <laughs> said, no, we're not doing that. Yeah, we're doing this, okay. So thank you everyone. This was awesome. This was so great. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely.